So we're looking at the economic data so far. We, we planned this presentation or the date for the presentation months ago, and then events kind of overtook us to a degree. Um, and, and we're very early. I mean, 6th of May, but particularly there is some data we are starting to see on the economic side. Um, importantly, I'm focusing on economic data, uh, not an epidemiologist. What we do know about COVID-19 and the pandemic is that truthfully, from an epidemiologist angle, we know very, very little. This disease has been around for, you know, what, 17 weeks, although now there are reports that the first case in France was 27 December, which is a month before what they thought the first case was. And that's the issue with uh, 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 viruses, particularly with COVID-19, is that early days, you just know so little about it. So really, I'm focusing on that economic because that's the area. Ironically, it was uh, two months ago, almost exactly to the day, 5th of March, I was doing a power hour in Durban. It was going to be, actually, I forget what the topic was going to be. Um, and then sort of a couple of days beforehand, I sort of started to see this, this what was then called COVID-19 coronavirus was starting to really gather momentum. So we flipped the topic. We looked at uh, you know COVID in the markets. And that day when I was in Durban, the first case happened to be announced. And, and that's the first dot. So it was 5th of March, the first case in South Africa. And at that point, we could see that something was happening here. I had been talking around coronavirus on my JC Direct podcast from as early as second, third week of January, but really we didn't know much then. By March, we could start to see that stuff was happening and that it was going to be, it was going to be frankly, somewhat ugly. Um, so the sense was, okay, flip that presentation. That was two months ago, and here's where we stand as of this morning. The, the numbers are staggering. I mean, if anything, when I did this presentation, and you can go and view it, the link is up at the top right up there. If anything, when I did that presentation back in March, I fundamentally under-expected what was going to happen. I said we were going to see recessions. I said recessions in Europe. I said recessions in America. I said markets would be down. I said the S&P down at around uh, 2,400, et cetera, et cetera. But I still largely underestimated both the pandemic response, but also the economic. And there is every risk that the same happens today. So this is not a drill. This is a tweet I made months ago that, you know, that, that this is not a drill. This is an epoch moment in our lives. This is going to be a defining point of the century. And I'll, I'll show you data, which actually suggests that this might just be a defining point in humanity and certainly from an economic data perspective. So lockdown, uh, these are the major economies that are currently in lockdown. Uh, interestingly, of the 10 largest countries population-wise, five are not in lockdown. Indonesia, Nigeria, Pakistan, Brazil, and Mexico, for various different reasons. But what we see here, and, and some of them, there's different types of lockdowns. Make no doubt about that. Um, China and Wuhan, lockdown was intensely hard. You weren't allowed to leave your building or your flat. They were bringing you food every couple of days. Italy, immensely hard. South Africa, immensely hard. US and UK, partial lockdowns in a sense. Um, so we've got a very large slice of the global economy in lockdown. And if you know, because of global supply chains, if some parts of the global economy is in lockdown, it impacts. You know, Indonesia might not be in lockdown, but their economy is going to be struggling because of inability to get some imports. And what about, you know, food security? I, I don't know if they import, but if they're importing food, are they currently able to? Those sort of issues suddenly come into play. This is Apple mobility data. And I want to say quickly two things. And Google also does mobility data, but they're only updated to 30 April, uh, which was Thursday. And I wanted more current data. I also appreciate that particularly in South Africa, Apple is a more high income. So perhaps is more, you know, Santon, Musgrave, Clifton than, than perhaps, you know, Alex, Kwamashu and, and uh, Google Etu. So we can take that as it is, but certainly what it shows us is when those lockdowns come into effect and we can see Italy quite early, we can also see that the initial stay, I mean, Italy was more than 80% of the population not leaving their house on any one given day. Um, and Italy did it proper, proper hard. And at points there, you can see it actually getting down to 
close to 90% of people staying at home. Um, the other economies, they're in lockdown, but are significantly less hard in a sense. Even at this point, uh, US and UK are talking around moving into lifting lockdown. Italy's started to lift, Germany as well. But even so, I mean, one in four Germans are staying at home every single day. One in two Italians. In the UK, it's one in two. In the US, it's one in five are staying at home. Uh, lockdowns have been significant to varying degrees. If we move across to South Africa, and again, you know, the disclaimer is these are apples, which in, in South Africa is, you know, the Apple phone is not a cheap phone. Even if you buy a cheap Apple, it's still an expensive phone. So we'll probably get different pictures, perhaps, if we looked at Google data. Um, you can see when the disaster was declared, you can see us going into hard lockdown. At that point, we've got about a 90% uh, uh, compliance with that hard lockdown. You can see the level four coming in. Um, and certainly that last date, 4th of May, is Monday, uh, when about a million and a half South Africans went back to work. But also we've got that three hour window in the morning where we're now able to exercise. So I think there's a lot more out there. I started a new radio show this week uh, on Monday. Um, I'm leaving home at about quarter to six and I'm coming home at about seven in the morning. On my way to the studio, there is nothing out there except some pedestrians um, and some public transport. But even coming back at, 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 at seven o'clock, you know, I'm at the MoneyWeb Studios, which is just next door to Rosebank, there's traffic, but not seven o'clock in the morning, Joburg traffic. I mean, it's quieter than you would see on a weekend. Um, so lockdown has absolutely been there. And we're at a point now where still pretty much half of our country stays home on any one given day. Um, and that means they're not going out to exercise, they're not going out to work, they're not going out to buy food, they're not going out for medical. They are staying in their house for that 24-hour period. And this is something I'm watching. And the, the key trend, which I'm going to come back to later, but let me illustrate it to you now quick, and you can see it here as well. You can see how lockdown starts and slowly edges higher. Even in the UK, Germany, USA, Italy, it is hard to sustain. South Africa, lockdown is hard. I mean, we, we know this, right? We have 41 days into lockdown. We, we, we get this. You know, lockdown is hard, even with the ability to now, some of us go back to work, uh, with the ability to exercise between six and nine in the morning. Keeping a populous lockdown is, is not an easy process. Initially, you know, we all in this together, and then slowly it starts to weaken. But I'm going to come back, so let's park that there for now. I pulled this one just for a couple of reasons. So these are essentially what we're looking at is what they call excess deaths. So this is FT data. Uh, note the dates. The data was published on the 1st of May, but they've only got the data to certain dates around April, somewhere from early to around mid-April. Uh, in some cases, 21 April, which is, I suppose, moving into sort of later April. What we're looking at here is we're getting a sense. What is a normal uh, expected uh, uh, mortality rate in a country or number of mortalities in a country by that date uh, using a number of years historic data and where are we right now? So 17 April, England and Wales, 27,000. Uh, you know, there's some, there's some big numbers coming through here. US on 11 April was uh, just under 21,000. What we see is South Africa. Now, what has our 41 day of lockdown brought us? If you, uh, Professor uh, uh, Kalim was on ENCA last week, uh, was it Tuesday, was it Wednesday, he was interviewed, uh, we were waiting for the, for Nkosuzana Glimini Zuma, Minister Glimini Zuma to speak. And he, he's been saying a couple of things. And the key thing he says is, look, we're not going to escape this disease running rampage in our, our country. We're not going to escape the, the exponential growth in cases and ultimately in deaths. What the 41 days did was get our hospitals to a position where they are more ready than they were 41 days ago. Are they perfectly ready? No chance, not a chance. Are they more ready than 41 days? Yes. I spent a week in hospital over Easter, and you know, from my first day in to my last day when I exited, um, and I spent four days in isolation. I'm perfectly healthy. No one knows what was wrong with me. Two COVID-19 tests, both negative. Um, from the first day of my arrival to the day when I left a week later, I could already see those changes happening. They were ready when I got in. A week later, they were a lot more ready. So that's what this lockdown has done and has largely done around the world. In some places, 
such as Italy, uh, it really was a case of lockdown to stop the spread of the pandemic. Um, in South Africa, it was to get the hospitals more ready. Are our hospitals perfectly ready? Not a chance. You know, first world hospitals aren't perfectly ready. There's even less chance that our hospitals will be. But it got us into a better place. Better is a deeply relative term. This is images I'm loving seeing. I mean, you know, we've seen the pictures of, of dolphins in, in, in the Venice canals. We've seen pictures of animals wandering the streets. We've seen the lions and Kruger lying on the roads, resting, etc. But pollution is telling us a really strong story. Top off is you know, European major capitals, March, April of last year, and then major European capitals, March, April of this year. And broadly, pollution is down about 50%. And that makes sense, right? Firstly, less industry. Secondly, less cars in the street. There's your pollution largely disappearing. The margin of error here is quite large. 15% is a massive margin of error. But we, we, we can live with that for now. What it shows is that, that impact. Now, the first time I saw these sort of images, it was particularly around Wuhan, where, of course, the center of the outbreak was. Um, now we're in a situation where it, it's much more global. I would love to see the, the Joburg pictures. I mean, I did going for a walk with my wife this morning. You know, when we moved to Joburg, yo, in fact, I think 12 years ago today, 13 years ago today, in fact, maybe no, Monday was 13 years. The one thing that defined Joburg for us was it had this smell. And that smell was diesel, essentially. Now suddenly we're walking around and it's kind of gone, like you're smelling other things. It's like quite weird. Now the pollution will come back, but it helps us get a sense of how effective slash hard lockdown has been. And obviously, if your pollution is half gone, your economy is half gone. I mean, th this picture tells it on its own, you know, the lack of pollution, it is gone. So let's get to some proper hard data. We're pulling stats. We don't have to extrapolate anything because we've got the data. Airlines, I thought a great place to start for, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, this is how people and goods move around our planet, sure. Yeah, internal to countries, maybe train or truck. Uh, ocean is absolutely important at the same time, but predominantly it is airlines. So this is BA data, um, and we're looking at different airplane types. And you'll see the three that are only between 40 and 80% uh, down, sorry, 60 and 80% down, which is giant numbers nonetheless, running at between 40 um, and 20% capacity. Those are your cargo flights. Um, so that's your, 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 your Boeings, your 787s, your 777s, your Airbus, your A350 uh, running in that space. They're there. Cargo is happening, but it's happening still a lot less. Passenger planes, which is all the others less down at the bottom there, they're more than 90% down. Now, I, I was chatting, chatting to Galich this morning from SA Flyer magazine, and he made an interesting point. He said a lot of cargo has started to travel, not during lockdown, but prior to lockdown, a lot of cargo now actually moves in passenger planes because we are sitting up front and there's all that space at the bottom. A lot of us aren't putting bags. So there's cargo happening there. So there's a lot of cargo not currently going in passenger flights because there's 90%, 95% less passenger flights happening. The other reason is that one of the industries that is going to be hardest hit by COVID-19 broadly and lockdowns in, in, in particular, one of the industries absolutely hardest hit is going to be airlines, is going to be travel, is going to be tourism. Um, and I'm going to come back to it, but I mean, absolutely, that, that is an industry. It's going to be a long time before I get back into an airplane. And I, I, you know, I'm someone who, in the 18 years that I've been flying, for the first time in my life, I firstly, I have no flights planned for the rest of a year, which for me is literally, I've flown cons consistently since 2002. Some years north of 100 flights. Um, I'll get back in a plane when I'm immune, either because I've had and, and recovered from COVID and I've got the antibodies and we know that they work, or because I've had a vaccine. I'm not getting into one of those tin cans and sharing 150 people's germs any time until I know that I'm safe. Um, and that has significant implica implications. Some of you will, and I'm going to come back to that. So that is BA flights, and that's broadly going to be Europe, or obviously they do some long hauls there. There's the A380s are sitting there. Most of these planes are frankly grounded, and your costs are still there. Here's uh, Transportation Security Administration in the US, otherwise known as the TSA. Um, so Fridays are big travel days for, for, for them, um, and particularly the the, the, that the Friday closest to a month end. And it was, so uh, 1st of May, which was Friday just gone, they saw their biggest throughput day since 29 March. 
So pretty much in, in a month, their biggest day that they had seen. 171,000 uh, passengers traveling. It is still 93.93% down on last year. Same day last year, they did 2.5 million passengers. And, and, and the US, if, we, if you remember that earlier flight on, on, on the mobility data from, from uh, 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 Apple, um, the US is one of those countries which is, they're in lockdown, but it's kind of like a quasi lockdown and it depends which state you're in and they're opening in bits and places and yet still look at that lack of travel. And that is people saying, you know what, I'm keen to go to the park, I'm keen to go to the pub, I'm keen to do whatever, but get in an aeroplane? You've got to be kidding me. 150 other people's viruses? And then Kame. And I was putting this presentation together yesterday and then events overtook. They issued a cautionary on Thursday saying they weren't going to open again until October or November and start operating. And yesterday, 3 o'clock, they went into business rescue. We now have three airlines in South Africa in a form of bankruptcy. Call it what you will. SAA, SA Express, and Kame. Uh, SA Express is toast not coming back. SAA in of itself, not coming back. But again, Guy Licht from SA Fly Magazine, he says, hang on a sec, they've actually got some valuable assets and government's going to have to throw some billions at it and it's going to take a year or so, but maybe it does come back in time. Maybe it is there eventually. Uh, and we'll see. I mean, I do, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Comair specifically said that they're going into business rescue to get the company into a better position so that they can come back around that October, November. So they plan to return. Of course, if you've got a ticket with Comair right now I, or, or Kalula, I don't know what happens with that. I mean, they, they haven't said. But, you know, this is an industry and, and this is, you know, lodges and, and tour guides and car rentals and hotels and Airbnbs. I mean, this is a sector that has been absolutely decimated. Um, in, in the US, I mean, Buffett was bought a whole lot of airlines, what, four years ago. He's sold all of them. The US airlines have been given $25 billion uh, bailout. That's what, about $450 billion are, and they want more. I mean, it's just not enough for them. Um, and we're not even talking cruise liners. I mean, talk about a tin can with 150 people. The cruise line is just a bigger can, but you've got 3,000 people. Personal spending. So we saw vehicle sales for April announced, uh, was it yesterday? Uh, in the whole month of April, 574 vehicles were sold. That is 98.2% down year on year. Now, you know, we expected the numbers to be lower than a year ago. We we're back into recession as an economy, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I've never, I mean, 500, that, that is less, what, 30 days in April. That is, uh, uh, that's less than 20 cars per day in April. I mean, as I stand here in Joburg, I can probably think of 20 dealerships in Johannesburg, which means that, I mean, I mean it, it's an, it, it is a staggering number. So personal spending is down. I mean, I'm noticing it at month end, I'm paying bills and I'm like, what's all this money doing in my account? Why? Well, because I'm not traveling. I, I, I haven't bought alcohol or cigarettes in 41 days. I'm going through my supply, but you know, I, I haven't bought any. I'm not eating out. Um, not even just a, a coffee at the coffee shop or a sandwich or never mind a dinner or, or, or something like that. Um, I've had two holidays canceled on me already, one uh, late March, one late April. Um, both of them short, but we're spending less. So is that money being saved? Well, yes, unless you've lost an income. If you've lost an income, then the money's not being saved. In my case, there's a little bit extra there. Um, and, and if you've still got your job and you're still getting your full salary as a household, there's a little bit of extra cash there. That will come back. That, that will come back. We need confidence. And I'm going to talk a lot about confidence. So let's park that there. U.S. U.S. personal spending. When I spoke earlier about the fact that we are in an epoch moment and we are setting data points that might never get worsened. I wanted to say beaten, but that, that's a bad colloquialism, worsened. Here is U.S. personal spending dating back to 1958. The previous worst was that on two occasions, once in the early 60s and once in the late 80s, personal spending dropped by around 2%. It just dropped by 75 I mean, that is, it just it so badly distorts the chart. It just dropped by 75 in, in the US. Now, again, is that money being saved? Well, not if you're one of the 30.2 million Americans who have lost your job. Um, but we are setting data points that are going to stand out for forever 
I mean, if not forever, certainly for generations. I mean, we're going back to data points that are last being made back in the 1920s and 1930s. And in some cases, we're exceeding it. And this is the scale of what lockdown has done. And this is the scale of what, is, what COVID-19 has created. COVID-19 gives us lockdown, gives us economic data points that are mind-boggling in their scale. I mean, there, for example, is the 2008-2009 crisis. I am on record as saying that that is the worst crisis in 100 years, and I hope we don't have another worse one in another 100 years. And well, here we are 12 years later, and we are getting data that's coming out markedly worse. There are lower data points than the 08 09, um, but what you'll note is they one offs. That 08 09 was that cluster of data over a number of, of periods, which was so incredibly bad. We are setting data points that are going to be visible on charts forever. GDP. So firstly, what are we looking at GDP? We're focusing on the quarter on quarter GDP rather than the annual, because the annual is just not giving us sufficient data. Even the quarter on quarter, which will be seasonally adjusted for the different seasons, that's just the statisticians doing their stuff. It's looking at the first quarter of 2020, January, February, March, essentially 13 weeks of activity. Aside from China, lockdown was in some economies starting from sort of early to mid-March. Italy, France, a couple of countries sort of around the middle, a little bit earlier in March, and then a lot more coming in, as including ourselves, coming in late March, and then, of course, uh, some coming into early April. So of the 13 weeks in that period, two or three were lockdown weeks. The rest were I don't want to say normal activity. January was kind of normal, February kind of, but even by mid-Feb, I think there were a lot of folks. When I did that flight to Durban uh, back on the 5th of March, I mean, I saw my first masks ever, um, a person wearing them at the airport. And I think I saw uh, three on the way down and a, a couple more on, on the way back. Of course, by then we'd had our first uh, COVID-19 uh, case confirmed in South Africa. Happened to be exactly where I was in Durban. So even this data is kind of like, it's, it's only a bit of COVID. What we also see is some countries do quite quick data, which we call a flash number, which will, in time, in a couple of weeks, a month or so, we'll see a data point that will come with a lot more uh, uh, clarity and a, a lot more reliability. South Africa does not do, um, get, does not do flash data. So here's what we have seen on the data so far. China, minus 6.8%. First negative reading on quarter-on-quarter -quarter GDP since 1992. Pretty much since China became a powerhouse. Now, China was in lockdown in Wuhan from early Feb. So let's park China. US, 4.8 down. EU, 3.5 down. France, 5.8 down. Italy, 4.7 down. Spain, 5.2 down. These are economies that maybe, in the case of Italy, France, and Spain, had three of the 13 weeks in lockdown. US didn't really have any yet. The lockdown really only well, it came in sort of towards the end of March, but it was state by state. You know, California went to uh, shelter in place, they call it, fairly early in the process, others a bit later. Uh, UK and Germany we'll see next week. South Africa, only 30 June. We don't do flash number. Those numbers are horror numbers. There's no halfway about it. They're horror numbers. And when you consider that it's only a couple of the 13 weeks that they had the lockdown, those numbers become staggeringly horrible. So what can we take from there and project forward? So here's the IMF forecasts. Uh, 2019, obviously historic. 2020 and 2021, uh, they are projecting. I think they look optimistic is my honest answer. Let's take South Africa. They're saying we're going to do minus 5.8 for this year uh, GDP. Uh, that is below the Reserve Bank and Treasury. Both Treasury and Reserve Bank are looking for around minus 6.4. Here's the one thing that you learn quite quickly about GDP predictions, is that by the end, they're right. But at the beginning, they are wholly wrong, because these predictions are being made, you know, what, three and a half months into a first pandemic in a, in a century. Um, we just, we, we don't know how to model this. You know, if this is, as I say, an epoch moment, we have no idea how we model this. We have no idea how to input it. Under normal circumstances, every time the good governor stands up at the MPC and gives us his expectations for, for GDP growth, every time the minister at his budget, and then again in, in, in October in his medium-term budget policy statement tells us GDP, you'll note they're always different. 
you know, what is the expectation for GDP for 2020, 21, and 22? They're always changing. They're either trending down if things are getting worse, or they're trending up if things are getting better. I think these numbers are wholly optimistic. That said, advanced economies minus six, emerged, uh, emerging and developed, developing minus one, I think if we can do that, we have good news. I mean, here is the European Commission. The data was published at uh, 11 o'clock this morning. They are broadly in line with what the IMF is saying, with one exception, the UK. They expect the UK to be harder hit this year and bounce back better next year. Um, but I look at these and I think if that's the, year, the impact, and I understand this is annualized, so this is not quarter on quarter. If that is the impact, I think we're actually going to do... Uh, I'll take that. If right now, if you tell me that's it, I think we'll take it. If you tell me for South Africa minus 5.8, I'll take that right now because I think we're going to get worse. What we also have to understand is that if we shrink 5.8% and then rise 4% in 2021, at the end of 2021, our economy is smaller than it was at the beginning of 2020. So they're going to say the world grows bigger and broadly emerging and developed does. The advanced economies, if they shrink 6.1 in 2020, and then only rise 4.5 in 2021, the global economy, the advanced global economy is smaller than it was at the beginning of 2020. This is a two-year impact minimum, and we're not back to where we started. We're still on a lower base in, in the sense of, of where we're sitting. I, I expect, I mean, I think I'm going to come to it with PMI in a moment. I think we're going to see some, some mind-boggling numbers coming through. PMI, Purchasing Managers Index. This is a index, truthfully, I largely ignore from month to month because it floats around. It's an index that goes between zero and 100. Below 50, you're contracting. Above 50, you're growing. It tends to tell us very little, but what's nice about it is it comes out quick. Local PMI for South Africa, business activity, 5.1. That is not just a record low. The previous record was in the 30s, which is how much of a record low. When I saw that number hit on Monday, I thought there was they put the decimal in the wrong place. And I thought, yeah, but it can't be 51. New sales orders, 8.9. The previous worst was in the 08 to 09 crisis, and we hit low 30s. If you look at the headline number, it's about 46 and change. There's some statistical oddities in that headline number. Because one of the metrics they use is what they call order speed. In other words, you order something, how long to get to you? Now, in a booming economy, it's a little bit slow to come to you because your, your, your supplier is so busy that they can't fulfill orders. So typically, they say if your order speed is stretching out, that's a good sign. Except, of course, <laughs> under lockdown, your order speed is stretching down because your supplier is shut down. So what we're seeing, the headline number had oddities, ignore that, business activity, new sales orders, that's what mattered. And this talks to supply chains. And I'm going to come to a bit more on that, so we'll park that. Here's our PMI for the rest of the world. This is all April, with the exception China. February was 35.7, March 52, April 50.8. That tells you the economy is growing again. China was weird. They already locked down Wuhan. Wuhan is a city of 11 million people. That's a New York, a Paris, a London. That's a big city. They're not many cities bigger. But they didn't lock down their, their major cities. They didn't lock down other provinces. And then there's always the question of how good is Chinese data? Uh, you know, even if we take it on the surface. But let's drill in. US 41.5. They've all got the statistical oddity to some degree. EU 33 and change. France 31. Italy 31. Spain 31. UK 32, Germany 34 and a half. India services came out today 5.4. These are in most cases as bad as we've seen before. They're back at 08 levels, or in some cases they are lower than 08 levels. What this is though, this is April. This is the first month of the second quarter, which we're gonna see GDP. At these numbers, we can expect some Q2 GDP quarter on quarter numbers to be well into the double digits. I'm talking, you know, GDP quarter on quarter for second quarter, minus 20, minus 30. Heck, I've even heard some people say minus 40%. That's what happens when you lock down a country. That's what happens when 80 or 90% of your population don't leave their house from day to day. That is people going out every week or 10 days for food, for medical, in some cases, for work in the essential service, healthcare, and a little bit others. Those numbers are horror. 
And I mean, what we now want to see is, is what's going to happen. Obviously, the big question is going to be, well, you know, what about May? What about June? What about those lockdowns easing? We'll touch on that. Let's quickly touch on supply chains. Supply chains have become globalized. And that gives us a just in time. And that means that we can get our iPhones at a great price. These are the components for iPhone. It's an older iPhone because I can't find as pretty an image for a current iPhone. But you note that it is eight different countries. It is 30 plus different products. And you need all of those to be in sync. If you've got one of those suppliers unable to, for whatever reason, maybe they went bankrupt, maybe they can't open because they had an outbreak of COVID-19, maybe they're in hard lockdown and not considered an essential service, who knows why, but you need all of those to be perfectly in sync. So it's not just about you know, unlocking economies, it's about getting global supply chains to be operating efficiently again. As a quick tangent, I think one of the things we're gonna see post-COVID, and I call it a new reality rather than a new normal, because I think normal is gone. I think it's going to be a totally new reality. I think we're going to have a major rethink of global supply chains. Um, some things like an iPhone, maybe, but a lot of things suddenly, why well, am I making that so far away? And when stuff gets real, I can't get it. Can I make it a little bit closer? Which is in one sense, good for the economy, some activity, but probably more expensive. Because these global supply chains, their purpose is to shrink prices. Unemployment initial claims, 30.3 million in the first six weeks. For context, in the entire 08, 09 recession, 32 million. In other words, by the end of this week, we would have exceeded in seven weeks more than the entire recession, which was 08, 09 was the worst recession in our lifetimes. Unless you are 100 years old and was alive in the 20s, we have just exceeded the worst recession in seven weeks. I talk about charts that become meaningless. If you look at the bottom of that chart, you can hardly see the Great Recession because of that spike. In, in, in 08 or 09, the biggest weekly claims was about 700,000. Now the smallest claim has been just under 4 million. The biggest has been over 6 million. And there are reports that people are not able to get their claims because systems are not designed to do 30 million claims in six weeks. Systems are designed that in a bad six-week period, in a horror six-week period, maybe five million, maybe four, maybe we'll hit seven, but not 30 million. So these are the weekly claims, and they're a great number because they're live, they're happening. You lose your job, man, you're, you're at that claim office as soon as you can. There have been challenges in terms of just processing system not designed for it, written in COBOL, which was a great computer language in the 60s. I mean, it's still a great computer language, but the computers are ancient and old and they can't process. Unemployment rate for the US will come out on Thursday. This will be to mid-April. So that probably, it's about 20, 20 million of these 30 million claims that we've seen so far, uh, maybe about 24 million. If we take a US labor force of about 160 million people, that means that we can expect an unemployment rate of 16% on Thursday. And that number will rise. Probably, it's certainly going to get past 20. The question is how much past? I think it was the Philadelphia Fed that said their worst case prediction for unemployment in the US is about 40%. Understand again, in the 08, 09, unemployment at 11. And that was a horror. We are breaking records here, left, right, and center. Unemployment in South Africa, look, our unemployment has been a horror since forever. Um, you know, what have we been floating around? 26, 27, 28%. Are we going to hit 35? Absolutely. I mean, just why not? I mean, an example. So one and a half million people went back to work under level four on Monday. Um, and I'm seeing reports that are suggesting that perhaps as many as four million South Africans have lost their jobs in the 41 days. So sorry, have lost or will lose their jobs during the lockdown of level five and level four, um, which is, you know, call it three times the number of people who've managed to get back to work on Monday because of the, 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 the slight relaxation between levels five and four. Unemployment is going to be a horror number. And we understand what happens here. Yeah, you're unemployed. You're not spending. You're, you're claiming onto government. Um, you're, you know, you're, 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 in a, you're in a, I mean, there's no way to put it. You're in a really, really bad space. And where do you get the new job from? It's not like there's new businesses popping up at the moment. <clears throat> and also, companies tend to fire quick and hire slow. So in America, the labor law allows them to do it. We've got a much more restrictive labor law. But in essence, as soon as things get tough, you fire people. 
because you, you, you want to save that money. When things start getting good, you don't want to hire too quick, right? Because A, you need confidence and certainty, but more than just confidence and certainty, what you also need to be sure of is you, know, you want that profit because as soon as you hire someone, you're actually throwing some profit away. So you fire fast, you hire slow. And we saw how quickly it spiked in 08 to 09 and how slowly it came back down. And we're going to see the same here. Remember that number on Thursdays to mid-April, so a lot of lag in that data. Commodities. So West Texas Intermediate Light Crude Louis, Light Sweet Louisiana, as it's called, went negative in April. I have seen crazy stuff in my life. I thought negative interest rates was perhaps going to be the craziest thing I'd ever see. And then oil went negative. And at that point, I'm like, I've seen everything. Surely I've seen everything. So it was a, it was a fundamental tweak. The, the key point is oil went negative. It was the delivery contract, which was, you know, for the, for the immediate delivery, um, and there was no storage. So you had oil you were going to get delivered on, but you didn't have storage. And where are you going to put every contract's 1,000 barrels? So you were basically saying to someone, hey, I give you 40 bucks a barrel. Take it off my hands. The price of WTI has recovered, but demand remains gone. That pollution that we don't see, well, that's because no one's using oil. No one's driving. No industry isn't working. Uh, Brent also under pressure off the lows. There's our chart of Brent. It was having a good uh, Wednesday, although when I checked just before I started presenting, uh, it was slightly down. It was back below 30. It, it's, it's off the levels of the worst levels. But what we are certainly seeing, man, it was 70 odd dollars back uh, you know, earlier in the year. And so it is, it, it, it's under significant pressure. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, oil producing nations are gonna struggle. Russia, Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, Iran, Norway. I mean, Norway. <clears throat> now, Norway has a sovereign wealth fund. They have a vast amount of money. They can manage it. Um, Saudi Arabia, hmm, Russia, ooh, Nigeria, ouch. Yeah, you know, oil producing nations are going to struggle. Uh, southern uh, USA, Texas, Texas, Louisiana, all those frackers. I mean, they're going to shut down at this point with, with either, they're, they're doing WTR, they're West Texas. The demand has disappeared. The, the storage is full. We're going to see massive, massive layoffs in that space. It is absolutely going to be a horror. PGMs, demand has disappeared. We saw that from vehicle sales. The PGM prices are holding up. Partly Anglo Platinum, remember, had gone into a force majeure. They had shut down a whole bunch of their production. That was removing five or 600,000 ounces. They're actually coming back earlier. They're going to reopen on the 14th, which is Thursday next week. But who's buying it? Where are these catalytic converters that these PGMs are going to go into? Gold, gold's your safe haven. The price has been doing nicely. It's been doing what it's supposed to do. Of course, you will notice that when markets collapsed in late March, gold went with it. When markets collapse, everything collapses. You know, that whole correlation, things are uncorrelated until stuff really hits the fan and then everything's correlated to one going down. So gold works. But when crisis hits, you can't pay your rent with gold. You want cash. You're worried. What do you do? You've got margin calls. Well, you sell your gold as well as everything else. Your Bitcoin, everything went down. Tax revenue? Yeah. What tax revenue? So, Kisweta, the SARS Commission has quoted today, they're expecting a loss of up to $285 billion in tax revenue uh, for this year. We don't have hard numbers. He is estimating. But, I mean, this is not a hard one to figure out, right? Where's the VAT? Uh, where's the income tax? Where's company profits? Where's fuel levy? Um, wh wh where's sin taxes on gambling, on liquor, on tobacco? Gone. I mean, in some cases, just gone. I mean, your sin tax, alcohol, uh, tobacco, and gambling, those tax revenues have gone to zero, absolutely to zero. Company profits are going to be diving. Income tax, if you've got a job, you're paying it. But if you ain't got a job, you ain't paying income tax. VAT, what are you spending money on? Uh, to the earlier point, personal spending has collapsed. This is going to be a global issue. Governments have got hit by two whammies. Uh, on the one side, they've got to spend their way out of it with stimulus. I'll come to more on that in a moment. On the flip side is uh, their revenue, which is tax, has vanished. It's completely and absolutely vanished. Import duties, gone. Uh, tax has just disappeared. So quickly, some results so far. Results so far largely useless. In South Africa, that to February or March doesn't tell us much at all. What we are seeing is the disappearing dividend. 
clicks, no dividend. They have no debt, you turn 2.3 billion rand of cash, and they're like, you know what, interim dividend, nah, we'll come back to you in six months, we'll have a look-see. Capitec, they would have paid about a one and a half billion of dividend, they say no, for two reasons. One, the Reserve Bank sent out a, a note saying to banks, hey guys, don't pay dividends, please. But also, you know, what's going to happen at Capitec? Well, they're going to start getting bad loans. That one and a half billion is going to be useful to them to actually keep. REITs, real estate investment trusts, we've seen some results coming out from there. Their issue is their REIT status is under threat. REIT status is a tax issue. Basically means the REIT doesn't pay tax, but they got a, just 75% of distributable income which is not an IFRS term, so it's whatever you want it to be, has to be paid as a dividend, and then we pay income tax on it. But folks like uh, Redefine didn't have any cash. They had a 33 cent to share distributable income they should have paid, they didn't have the money. So the bigger issue becomes liquidity. And liquidity is a company's act. If your company is not, it doesn't meet the right liquidity ratios, as a director, it is your fiduciary duty to put the company into, into business rescue. So some of them, equitous results, different ball game, great numbers, et cetera, but there's, in, the, in the REIT space, it's gonna be ugly. In the US, numbers to late March, Apple wasn't bad. Amazon, obviously, knocked it out the park. Of course they did. They're selling more online stuff than they ever have. But Amazon's reported a profit for five years, 20 quarters now, and they said, look, next quarter, we're gonna make a profit, about $4 billion, but we're gonna spend all of that $4 billion on COVID-19 related costs keeping staff safe, social distancing, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what we're seeing. So Clix is open, right? They're not selling everything, but they're selling a lot. ShopRite is open, they're selling a lot. Pick and pay, spa, uh, discount. They're open and they're selling stuff, but they're not selling everything, but they're incurring higher costs. They're putting up screens. They're having to get masks and sanitizers for their staff. They, they're gonna, the distribution warehouses are gonna be less efficient because of social distancing. They're doing some business but they're not gonna be getting the same levels of profit because business will be a little bit down. I mean, the one benefit is I haven't eaten out in 41 days, which means everything I've eaten has been bought at, a, you know, at, a, at, at one of these food retailers. You know, no, no, no dinners out or anything, but the costs are gonna go on work. J. Crew, Chapter 11, Buffett bailed on airlines. What's most telling is that guidance has been pulled. America's big on guidance. This is what our revenue will be, our profits updated every quarter. Guidance is disappearing from the US no surprises. What we really want to see is start seeing those results to August, to September, and in the US will be to June. Stimulus packages touched on this. The US, very aggressive, three trillion, more coming. How do they pay for it? They print. Tax revenues are down, they print it. EU, yeah, EU, fought with negotiations. They've managed a 500 billion euro which is nice, although it pales in significance to the US. Uh, individual countries will also do. Um, and these, these, are, these are in tax relief, these are to businesses, um, you know, airlines and the like, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and going to individuals and everything else. So Africa, we don't really have much, do we? So we did 500 billion, bit of a fudge number because it's not all hard money. For example, 200 billion of that is the government underwriting loans that the, the, the banks will do. So that only comes out if you default and you've got a six month holiday, so it's kicking the can down the road. About 70 odd million is deferring tax. You owe us the tax, but don't pay it now, pay it in a little bit of time. The real impact was social grants. Social grants are an effective way to get money into the hands of the poorest who will then spend it on what they need the most, heating, lighting, transport if they have work to go to, and most importantly, food. So, so social grants are really working. We're gonna have to do more. What are all of these, Stimulus packages do, they need us to print money, they're gonna ramp inflation, they're gonna weak currencies. But if we all do it, and all of our inflation goes up, and all of our currencies weaken, aren't we all kind of in the same boat? The point is, we don't really have options here. You know, if, I, if our reality is that we're gonna have some inflation in a week as are, or we're not gonna have South Africa, well, we'll take the inflation in the week as are. Sport, I'm gonna to touch on this one quickly, because people keep on saying, Here's my thing, sport is not happening in 2020. The logistics are impossible. I know the Durban July has been delayed three weeks. Comrades will happen in, 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 in September. Uh, football will restart. It won't. Not even with a, 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 an empty stadium. The, the quarantine process is just impossible. You have to quarantine entire leagues, support to medical staff, media, catering. Uh, uh, I see the, 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 the typo there. So that rug quarantine should be rugby. 
Um, bus drivers, for example, uh, rugby issued a, World Rugby issued a document today. There's the link down at the bottom. They say for a game in an empty stadium, including players, they need 250 people. And that excludes accommodation, transport, and catering. 250 people who have to be in isolation for two weeks beforehand, or quarantine, who then, if you then want them to play again in a week's time, can't touch anyone. They need to be staying somewhere. They need to be getting transported. They need to be getting fed. The logistics, it's just not there. Live, so so one-off events. For example, there's apparently a golf tournament. Two golfers go and play some golf. I can see that happening. A, a tennis match between two tennis players. You know, that's a handful of people. I can, you know, I can see sort of exhibition-type matches happening. But broadly, sport is not happening. If you are paying for DST premium right now, stop paying because you know what? You ain't getting no premium. And you're not going to get any for the rest of the year. DSTV, multi-choice, they're in deep, deep trouble. I'm not going to go down that road, but there's a top tip for you there. Recession or depression? So recession, two quarters of negative GDP. It's a technical term. Severe recession, three quarters. How quickly can we rebound? Depends on lockdown, length, severity, adherence. And understand that lifting lockdown is not going back to how life was in January. Lifting lockdown is like I can go walking for three hours in the morning. Um, I can, you know, I mean, the, January is gone. We're not getting back to January, not next January, maybe the January after. So what's the depression? Or well, depression, technical term, long-term downturn in economic activity, which tells us nothing. It's complete gobbledygook. In essence, four quarters negative GDP growth. So we've already got quarter one locked and loaded. Quarter two is going to be an absolute horror show, locked and loaded. We've got recession. South Africa was already there. I'm talking the rest of the world. Quarter three, we're going to be negative. So we've got severe recession. Can we get four quarters? I think so. I, I, as I said, I think that the GDP numbers for 2020 are optimistic, deeply so, and I think 2021 even more so. Absent of a cure or a vaccine. Lockdown remains in some form. This hurts economies. Recoveries will be slow. As I said, quick to fire, slow to hire. And consumer confidence is low. And I've mentioned that. I'm going to come back to it, our pocket. So markets, April, best month since 1987. Go figure. The collapse was the fastest collapse since 1987. And then April was the best. S&P 500, top 40 local market, global markets around the world. April was an amazing month. But don't confuse stock markets with reality. So the theory is stock markets look forward. But what is the stock market looking forward to? So here's a chart. The S&P 500 forward 12-month PE is the highest it's been in a decade. Pause a moment. We're in a pandemic. The first in 100 years. Most of the global economy is locked down. And yet our market is the most, not our market, the US market is the most expensive it's been. Does that make any sense to anybody? Now, if we suddenly find a cure or a vaccine and life goes back to normal in July, okay, maybe, sure. But, I mean, are we really talking about July? Or if we are talking about July, which July? This year, next year, the year after? The stock markets are crazy things. They try and predict the future. They usually get it wrong. And I can't... The, the most expensive market in 10 years whilst we are in the middle of a first pandemic in a, in a century, no sense. So, some conclusion. The data is early days. I, I knew this when I scheduled this, but I thought let's get an early look. Data is early days. Uh, the April PMI, US initial claims, the exceptions, they're giving us some idea and they are telling us that uh, second quarter, Q, quarter on quarter, GDP globally is going to be a horror show. We will need more data. We are literally five weeks into this quarter. We have got another eight to go. Let's watch that data as it carries on rolling through. Um, it is bleak, but it, it, you know, how do you, so how do we fight a pandemic? Well, the easy way is that every single person goes into their own corner and, you know, that's it. We don't even like, not even families. Every family member gets their own corner and stays there. 
We've been doing that to a degree, but that's not sustainable for the long term. That mobility data I showed you up at the beginning of the presentation, it's just not sustainable for the long term. But, you know, we, we, we need it and we need some level of, of lockdowns. Otherwise, this gets completely and absolutely out of control. Lifting lockdown starts to give us new data. So I'm particularly watching Spain, who started on the 13th of April, but really only last weekend. Germany started 20 April, but again, really only last week. April, sorry, New Zealand started coming back last Monday. Italy this Monday. And I'm watching those economies because there is a three to four week lag. Remember, two week incubation period on COVID-19. So for the first two weeks, you're looking at old data. Then you start getting the new data coming through and you start getting a week or two of that. So really there's that three to four week incubation testing. So for example, we're in stage four. When do we go to stage three? Not before June. I, frankly, I think mid-June, but not before early June, because it's going to be it's going to be 15th of, of May before we're two weeks in, and we start to see some data. It's going to be 22nd of May before we start getting data we can use. It's going to be 29th of May before we actually get a sense of what level four looks like in terms of new cases uh, and mortalities. So I'm very much watching these economies, and they're all doing their lifting of the lockdown differently. But I'm watching them closely, because and, and make no mistake, so is our government, so is our health ministers, William Kesey, so is Professor Karim. This is what we're watching. The other, you know, we have so little data on, on the pandemic. This is all we've really got. Watch that to get a sense of how it works. How do the economies do? How do the, the infection rates do? And do they have to go back into stricter lockdown? That is perhaps going to be our biggest teller. Expect Q2 data to be a horror show. I've said enough about that. How quick a bounce back? So the markets are saying, quick, quick, markets are saying it's fine. Epidemiologists are way more cautious. And you know what, if that person on Twitter hasn't got epidemiologists in their handle or isn't a health minister, or, you know, there's a lot of opinions out there. And I appreciate we're not getting much peered review because it just takes, it's too slow. But listen to the experts, not the Facebook fans. So what do I think? I think ignore what the markets are saying. I mean, trade the markets, of course. I mean, trade them. Absolutely. There's been money to be made hand over fist in these markets. Um, index futures, thing of beauty. But I don't think the markets are saying everything's going to, I mean, the markets are saying everything's going to be okay, but don't think the markets know what they're talking about. They're not epidemiologists. They are markets. Uh, cure or vaccine is what's going to fix the solution. Not promises, not theories, not this drug, the other drug. There's lots of excitement. Uh, we need hard data. Currently, the expectation from the experts is a vaccine, second half of 2021, maybe second quarter. Then we've got to produce 7 billion of them. Then we've got to inject 7 billion people. Understand, we've never done that before, not even close. Watch those countries lifting lockdown, see how they're doing. Uh, and that's going to be my key thing. Of course, the PMI coming out for, for May, which we'll get in a month's time. I'm uh, watching US unemployment. Uh, severe recession. I think we're in it three, three, three quarters, negative GDP, easy depression, I think very likely. The data so far is as bad or worse than I expected. Go check that presentation I did just two months ago. Man, I, I very carefully walked a line. I, I wanted to press it was going to be bad, but I didn't want to be alarmist. If I'd been alarmist, I still would have been too conservative. Um, it's going to be here. It's going to hurt. I mean, this is not going away in a hurry. One of the big things is that confidence, and I've talked about it a lot. But it's confidence to spend, it's confidence to hire, it's confidence to get back into an airplane. It's confidence to, to, to do things that would normally be under normal activity. And different people will respond differently. You know, how soon do you go back to a bar or take a flight? You know, for me, a flight is simple. I need to be immune to this COVID-19. A bar, yeah, okay. I mean, it's gonna depend on the bar. You know, I'm thinking a bar, Monday afternoon, three o'clock, nice big outside area, me and my wife, nobody else around. That works. A packed Friday night bar with a thousand people, well, that's going to take a little bit longer. And, and what we've got here, people keep on saying new normal. No, no, we're not going back to new normal. We're going back to new reality. And we get to define that reality. And, and I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. It's a whole different story. But IBM did a survey, 25,000 adult Americans during April, and 54 of Americans said they want to work from home primarily. That is what the future they want. 75% said occasionally. 10% they're going to stay away from bars and restaurants for the rest of the year. Now you're saying, well, that's only 10%. The other 90 are going. Yeah, yeah. But that 10% is where the, where the restaurants and bars make their profit. 
airlines don't make a profit until their occupancy goes above typically 70, 80%. That 10% is the profit. And then what about the elderly, the immune compromised, the sick? And they aren't going anywhere either. So another slice. So even as we start to move into the new reality, even as things start to come better, there's still going to be a large slice of the economy, which is going to be, nope, not for me. Maybe because they're old, maybe because they're immune compromised, maybe just because they're scared. And those are all perfectly valid reasons. So I don't, you know, pre-COVID economic activity, I mean, 2022, I think at best. We, 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 can, we can get a lot better, but you know, when do we get back to the global GDP levels of 2019? Not before 22, at the very earliest, unless a miracle happens. And, and, and post-lockdown is not back to normal. As I say, it's, we, we've got to define that new reality. So far, all projections have undershot. They've all been wrong. The data has been worse, whether it's been medical, whether it's been economic, Every piece of data I've seen has come out worse than expected across the board. What we need is confidence. And as this drags on, as this takes longer, we're in day 41 of lockdown. How about day 100? How about month 14? It'd be a different lockdown, perhaps, but it's eking away at our confidence. It's just, it's, 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 it's crushing us in a sense. And it's tough out there. And the economy is going to take a long time to get back to those 29 levels. That's me, I thank you for your time. If there are questions, I have some minutes. I will certainly take some questions. Mike, you're asking, is a wealth tax likely? I think so. I think a wealth tax is likely. I don't just think South Africa, I think probably globally economies are looking at it. Um, I do think wealth taxes probably are wealthy, uh, uh, e the exact details in terms of how much and who and everything else, but governments need money desperately. Taxes collapsed. They're spending on stimulus, uh, that, that gap is giant. You can only, I mean, eventually you run out of trees and you just can't print anymore. Um, anonymous, what do you think the best place to be trading? Which sector should I just stick to index trading rather? Uh, anonymous for me, I, I'm an index trader. I don't like the single risk of an individual stock. What I mean by single event risk is, you know, uh, Kame goes into business rescue. And you were either long or short of Comair, whichever side of the equation you were, and well, now what? So I'm an index trader, uh, FX, but I typically say FX is for the pros. I'm a huge fan of index trading. Uh, you can, I mean, and, and there's you know, things, markets will do it for you all over the place. You can trade. I like trading the top 40, the Aussie index. I like the S&P, but I hate the time zones. I, I don't want to be trading until t half past 10 at night. I have a life, and I also have an early morning radio show. I like the DAX. DAX is a great one to trade, um, and there's no correlation really between us and the DAX. FTSE is not bad. There used to be a lot of correlation with the FTSE, but less so these days. But uh, to me, it's about indices. Man, there's money to be made there. Uh, should one stay invested? Look, I have stayed invested. Um, in an ideal world, I would have sold everything at the beginning of Feb, I would have rebought it at the end of March and I'd be a whole lot richer. Uh, I'm also a believer that this is a W recovery. In other words, we'd have another leg down, which then everyone says, well, shouldn't we then be exiting and taking our money? Uh, my answer is no, because maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it runs another 20% before the leg down. My long-term investing, I'm leaving. I'm still buying my monthly ETFs and then I'm trading away. I'm not stressing that at all. Um, Headley, you're asking the impact on the currency. So, in a perfect world, the czar should be moving weaker, except last week, Thursday, we had 18, and we've been coming back a bit again uh, today after a bit of weakening out. And the driver behind this is go look at our 10-year bonds. People have been buying. So last week, we got booted out of the World Government, uh, World Government Bond Index, WIGBY is, it, is its short name. Um, which meant passive trackers had to exit it. A lot of investment managers have a mandate that says you can only buy investment grade sovereign bonds, which means they can't buy ours. If they had them, they had to sell them because we're now full junk. However, a lot of folks at the same time are quite able to buy non-investment grade. Uh, and then really it's quite simple. You go and you buy a good yield. And in South Africa, you can buy yourself a 10% yield on government bonds. You can buy insurance for a default cost you a percent, you can put a hedge on the currency, you're locking in 7% in this market, 7% isn't bad. So 
Yes, the currency should weaken, but the attraction of our bonds, before a foreigner can buy our bonds, they need to buy our currency. Hence, the currency hasn't blown out as badly as we thought. And don't for a moment think that that foreign investor buying our bonds cares about politics or cares about any of that. They care about returns. No more, no less. Mark, always a pleasure. Uh, where do you start? Unit you know, trust or ETF? Which one is lower in risk? They're broadly the same, except the distinction between active and passive. Uh, unit trusts are typically passive. In other words, the experts try and beat the market. 85% of them fail. I like ETFs. You can buy them in the US in dollars. You can buy them on the JSC. I like the globals, the Ashburton 1200, a couple of S&P 500s. That's typically where I am would, would be suggesting people are starting. Uh, I'm seeing lots of flashing happening here. What am I missing? I am missing chat. Uh, yeah, always a pleasure. Government bonds at the moment, how attractive are they? So government bonds are attractive. So the government retail bonds, Google uh, government retail bond South Africa, are offering you 10% locked in for five years. That's not a bad rate. That's a fairly attractive rate. I, I quite like that. Uh, it was offering 11.5% last month, and I put my wife into some of them. Um, Herbert uh, Tladesa Dota showed more COVID testing when the private sector ignite further debate on NHI implications on taxation and public finance, health sector stocks. So, a couple of points. NHI, I think, is put on the back burner for now. Simply, we can debate whether we did have the money. We now certainly don't. Healthcare stocks are interesting. I was in a hospital, 100 bed hospital, five of us, five people. So what hospitals are seeing is occupancies have absolutely cratered because there's just no, you know, because non-elective you know, elective surgery is out the door. They're chasing you out of hospital incredibly quickly. Um, equipment suppliers, depends on the equipment. Uh, masks and stuff, there's definitely some space there. I'm doing a webcast on Friday. Drop me a mail. It's there. I'll send you a link. I'm going to be looking at healthcare ETFs, US listed, because we don't have any in South Africa. Any thought on the Satrix SA bond ETF? Uh, because it's... Uh, kind of junk rated. Uh, Regan, it's not kind of junk rated. It's 100% junk rated. The, the, the bond ETFs, and if you drop me a mail, I'll send you a video I did last week. I don't like the bond ETFs. If you want to get bond exposure, go to the retail government bonds. They're nice, they're clean, they guarantee you a rate. Uh, index trades, reasonable minimum for a novice to start with. So it, it, typically, if you're trading a mini index contract, you can get away with about 10 or 20,000 ZAR to start trading. Um, and if you're looking to be trading uh, CFDs on equity, you need probably about 30 to 50,000 ZAR. Uh, Ivo, do you think property companies will eventually recover? Many of them will which of course is a dodge answer, isn't it? Because that means many of them won't. Look at debt levels, look at loan uh, to value. Um, if they've got a loan to value in the 20, or even low 30%, which means they've got buildings worth a billion, but their loans are 20 or 30%, in other words, two to 300 million, those are fine. When your loan to values are in around the 40% and you start hitting these issues and tenants not paying, stay away. Look at their debt covenants. Redefine loan to book values, uh, loan to values uh, 44%, that's fine, but their covenant sorry, is risky, their covenant is 50. So uh, property, you know, growth point, yeah, yeah, growth point will be fine. Equitus, love their numbers, but uh, property stocks, we're gonna see some big properties go down. You know, of that, I, I'm fairly sure. I don't know which. Is the South African government are likely to allow early withdrawal of pension provident funds with reduced taxes? I don't know. I don't, I, I, I maybe, but I think under very extenuating circumstances. In other words, not just because you want to, but maybe because you are 51 and you've been retrenched and your odds of reemployment are slim. Um, I think it's going to be a long ask. And also understand, and Ibrahim Batal has said it in as many words, is we have a, a country of, of different parts. And the one part is a poor part of the country who don't have pension savings. They're going to be using state pension. And then the kind of richer part. And the government errs to either side. I think in that space they might say, no. It, it's a debate that we will probably have. Are REIT companies allowed to still pay their dividends with this kind of environment? So REIT companies have to. The law says pay 75% of distributable income. Otherwise, if you don't, and then Siri wants to talk to me. If you don't pay, you're no longer a REIT, and that has all sorts of implications. But then they've got liquidity issues. Uh, check out my JC Direct podcast tomorrow morning. I talk about it in detail. Just one lap.com slash JC Direct. It will be live from 5.30 in the morning. Uh, Neil, absolute pleasure. Uh, 
Nolan, I'm currently following the Just One Lap ETS strategy, high risk. Do I keep buying monthly it is to keep the percentages? I, I, I continue to, to, to buy my monthly ETFs. So I got some very, very cheap ones late March, early April. Um, you know, if you're a long-term investor, plus 10-year time horizon, uh, this is going to be hard. The markets are going to be soggy, and your retirement is going to be a little less joyful. Your wine might be a little younger. Heck, it might even be in a box. But as long as we're out of lockdown, we will at least be having some wine. My retirement strategy, my long-term investment strategy hasn't changed in the least. Ladies and gents, I'm not seeing any more questions come through and I have hit my time. So uh, this was part of our Think Markets. We've got a couple more events every Wednesday this month. You'll get a uh, justoneup.com slash events. The email that was sent to remind you gives you details around that. Uh, and then the first one, every Wednesday of every month, we do a Think piece. Uh, this was today's. We've got two more, which will be June and July. I'm not sure what I'm going to do for June and July. That is my challenge. I need to know that by Monday. Uh, but if you were here today, you're automatically booked for the others. Next week, I'm doing uh, introduction to derivatives. I'm looking at indices, FX, and CFDs. Week after, I'm doing trading 101. And the week, 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 week after, in other words, fourth Wednesday of May, Redwan Muller or one of his colleagues will be doing using the Think Markets website. Um, you'll get all the links to book for that, so you can go and find those. Last question was pushing the Nasdaq so high. Uh, tech stocks. Amazon. Uh, Microsoft, knockout quarters. Uh, Alphabet and Facebook, not too bad. Apple, fairly good. It's enthusiasm. Are they right? Not sure. Are retail bonds guaranteed? Uh, both the bond and the interest is guaranteed by government. Uh, is government going to default? Nope, because they can print the money. Why would they default to their own citizens? And defaulting, I mean, technically, you can't default in a bond in your own currency. You can only really default in a foreign denominated bond. It is a technicality, but I mean, my sense, I, I had no worries putting the money in. The risk is, is that they print their way out of trouble to repay the bonds and then we get inflation and your money is therefore has less spending power. Will you get your money plus interest back? Sure. Will it be worth much? Don't know. That answer we'll have in five years. Ladies and gents, always appreciate your time. Last point, drop me a mail time-wise. This was supposed to be a live event in Santon and webcast. COVID prepared to that. Six o'clock work for you? Eight o'clock better? I don't know. Let me know what your time is. For me, six works because early mornings, but Simon at justonelap.com, drop me an email. If you've got a preference for time, let me know what that is. Everyone, stay safe. Uh, stay locked down. Wash your hands. Cheers all. Thank you for your time today.